Have you started? Nice. IT, have you started? No, this should happen. We are about to start. Okay, great. So, good evening, yeah, okay. everyone, and uh, welcome to the first online event hosted by the Center for Middle East Studies. The topic that we have chosen for the event today is one of extreme importance to understanding the current geopolitical dynamics of the region. And we are honored to have with us some very distinguished guests who will be speaking on the same. So thank you for uh, accepting our invitation, Dr. Awad and Dr. Habib. Uh, so the Middle East, as we all know, is a region that is characterized by its complexity and by notions of change. And over the past five or even 10 years, many regional dynamics have in fact been drastically altered. Some of them perhaps irreversibly. So while on the one hand, conflicts have failed to cease, on the other, a few states have become more revisionistic, bringing with themselves a new identity to the region. Now these geopolitical realities or dynamics have been further complicated by the presence and the aspirations of new actors in the region. We at the center of Middle East studies therefore believe that it is once again time to map the regional developments and the changing tectonics which will not only have consequences to the Middle East itself, but also to the international system. Our speakers today will be drawing on these phenomena in presenting to us an image of the region that we as outsiders, or we at the Jindal Global University, may fail to see. The Center for Middle East Studies was launched at the initiative of Ambassador Dr. Abdul Fattah Amora, the Vice Dean of the Jindal School of International Affairs in 2016, with the main objective of fostering interdisciplinary research on Middle East studies in collaboration with regional academics, experts, and practitioners. Now our speakers today who are experts in the field themselves will be contributing towards this goal of the center through their valuable insights during this webinar. As part of our webinar, we were also supposed to have with us uh, His Excellency Dr. Rabi Nash, who is the ambassador of Lebanon to India. And he was looking forward to the event. However, due to an emergency, he will not be able to attend today's lecture. So our first speaker for today is Dr. Wael Awad, who is a senior journalist based in South Asia since 1979. And as a war reporter, he has covered not only West Asia, the Middle East, but also Sri Lanka, Kashmir, and Afghanistan. He worked as the bureau chief of the Middle East Broadcasting Center in London. MBC, FM Radio, Kuwait, Oman, and Damascus Radio. He was also the South Asia Bureau Chief of Al Arabiya TV channel between 2002 and 2012, and later also served as President of the Foreign Correspondents Club of South Asia for two terms. Dr. Awad was also the recipient of the fifth Rajiv Gandhi Excellence Award in 2014 for the best journalist from overseas and is also the recipient of the Freedom of Speech Award. We are glad to have you with us here today, sir. Yeah. However, before Dr. Awad delivers the keynote address on the shifting tectonics in the Middle East, I would like to invite the Dean of the Jindal School of International Affairs, Dr. Sriram Cholia, to provide the introductory remarks for the event. Professor Cholia. Thank you, Zeus. Um, greetings, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, very happy to inaugurate the first online um, seminar of the Center for Middle East Studies uh, in the midst of the corona pandemic. Um, we at Jindal School of International Affairs and Jindal Global University uh, are very proud of the way this center has risen to the, um, you know, to the notice and the attention of both policymakers and scholars. And um, we, uh, I want to especially thank my colleague, um, Professor uh, Abdul Fattah Moura for his leadership uh, because without him, this center would not have taken off. And uh, while we have uh, centers covering various regions, uh, the Middle East slash West Asia had been uh, lying vacant until Professor Amura came. So thank you, sir, for your um, pioneering efforts because of which we have reached this stage. And um, I'm glad to also share with all the audience 
participants the fact that the center has been producing some amazing publications the most recent one a very comprehensive one which i hope that uh, all of you will be able to read with um, writings by scholars as well as students the involvement of students is a special um, attribute of our research centers so they are faculty led but student driven <clears throat> that's what we call our research centers and uh, professor mura has uh, brought together large number of masters um, and bachelor students and even some phd students to be involved in the center's activities and um, our goal as always it's an as an indian university uh, india's national interest and uh, india's rise in the world uh, must be accompanied by world class knowledge production on different regions of the world especially those which are uh, geographically and uh, strategically very close to india including the middle east so um, cmes uh, is filling that uh, important gap for us and uh, we request all the uh, distinguished guests uh, our great friend uh, dr wai lawad who is uh, delivering the speech today and also um, one of the best known intellectuals from the region professor kamil habib um, from beirut who is also joining us uh, we want your blessing sir uh, so that the center keeps going forward and uh, you are consent to uh, deliver the uh, remarks today uh, and to enlighten all of us uh, really means a lot to us so thank you um thank you at the outset <laughs> uh, i wanted to just flag a few things that we here in india and in the rest of the world are seeing lately in the region and uh, perhaps that can trigger some of the thoughts that um, dr awad Uh, and professor habib will share with all of us the first was of course this you know the flurry of the so called uh, peace deals or recognition deals that we are seeing in the last uh, few weeks um two have recognized in a hurry uh, the uae and um 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 bahrain and then uh, president donald trump says six to seven more are ready to recognize or are in the pipeline he says and they are working on sudan they say the media says and then perhaps uh, kuwait and oman um even lebanon it's we just heard the news that there is they are started negotiation with israel on um, maritime gas boundary issue lately so it does seem like there is a flurry uh, or some kind of a, and all of it timed i think for the us election which is just one month away um so uh, that uh, seems to some seems to be a positive development because the arab israeli conflict as it was framed originally included um, some of these uh, uh, countries uh, which used to uh, insist that unless there is a palestinian state they will not recognize israel but now they have uh, entered a new paradigm altogether so for some people it seems like this is some kind of a virtuous cycle of peace that is developing but on the other hand we know that the um, if you look at the levant region um, the parallel to this development this recognition uh, is the instability uh, and the extreme uh, 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 tension that arises uh, involving iraq syria and lebanon and uh, i don't see how the recognition of israel by some of the sunni uh, monarchies will anyway reduce or lessen the tensions involving uh, lebanon syria and and iraq because parallelly to the to this so called happy development are the um, governance issues that are coming up in these countries and also the question of the of of iran's influence in these countries and the attempt to push out iran from these countries uh, which it seems is going to strengthen now so on one hand you have the so called burying of the hatchet of the past by some of these monarchies but on the other hand sharpening of the knives as far as trying to um, uh, excommunicate or exclude iran from the emerging architecture uh, and this in turn leads to a tit for tat response and we know uh, those of you who are following what is happening inside iraq uh, it's very critical uh, and the same uh inside syria the same uh, uh inside lebanon so my feeling is that uh, we need to keep both of these in perspective the western media 
is highlighting more of the these recognitions of israel but the downside of it remains and of course the palestinian issue remains unresolved and there are refugees uh, uh, from palestine in all these countries that i've just mentioned uh, especially syria and lebanon and uh, 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 and in in jordan so there are all these uh, things that may come to a boiling point and we cannot rule out actually in spite of the so called uh, peace deals we cannot rule out uh, uh, limited wars from breaking out uh, and already i think the the uh, kettle is simmering so this uh, parallel logic of these two processes is something we need to keep in mind uh, the organizers also uh, wanted the speakers to touch on turkey and turkey's role in the region um, is another big uh, in my view a destabilizing factor uh, i recently wrote a book um, on uh, emerging powers and one of my chapters was on turkey and um, turkey uh, is meddling uh, increasingly in almost all the affected countries they have got a huge military presence in northern syria they are still present in in iraq uh, in the kurdish areas they are started uh, you know uh, mercenaries and bombing campaigns in Li- in libya uh, across the mediterranean and they are also confronting greece and and france in the in the in the oceans for naval supremacy uh, and they have got a old uh, tussle with russia going uh, in all these in many of these theaters so turkey is playing increasingly a kind of a aggressive militaristic role in the region which i believe is also another destabilizing factor so uh, taking all these uh, elements together we have actually a combustible mix just because some uh, monarchies gulf monarchies are recognizing israel i don't think is a cause for us to be very optimistic rather it seems like they are circling the wagons to try and isolate iran and i think that's there's a dangerous dynamic coming out of it now the one imponderable of course is the us election and uh, uh, one hears that the iranians have decided to keep a low profile and just wait uh, and see what happens um, after november 3 um, if joe biden uh, he wins the election which many people are predicting is likely now uh, then possibly this dynamic may shift and we may actually see some kind of a you know reconciliation a uh, process between iran and the us again which may in turn uh, actually generate the peace dividends that the region needs so um my own view you know and for us india you know iran remains important for strategic reasons india has invested in the chabahar uh, port and uh, in the last four years um, trump administration sanctions and other pressures we have not been able to fulfill the promise of the chabahar port uh, in the in the western end of the of the persian gulf so um, that remains very critical for india to access central asia and to access afghanistan and to secure our own uh, borders from uh, jihadist extremism so taking all these factors into account i think it's a um, it's fair to say that nothing is settled and um, we will have to wait out and see what happens um, recognitions uh, plus a possible change of regime in the us uh, might ultimately help but um if there if 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 there is a trump administration 2.0 then i am afraid that we are looking down the barrel at a very long road ahead in terms of uh, conflict and struggle in the region um so i'll stop there there is of course the corona pandemic there are other problems um, um which have uh, affected uh, uh, this region as much as they have affected us here in south asia mm, and uh, I, i my only hope is that we can all come up with a you know a conceptually different way of thinking about the region um the the the, the israeli uh, prime minister went to the un general assembly just uh, i think last week and um, claimed that you know there are missiles uh, that have been placed here and there and that uh, a new war is going to be launched and all these things so the the drum beat for war is never far away especially in this region because of the proxies and the external players especially so uh, let us uh, you know keep cool heads let us not aggravate matters but at the same time see how we can achieve stability 
uh, and my uh, reasoning has always been that you need to have an inclusive security architecture to bring stability not a one that excludes key players like iran so i hope that um, jewish people turks arabs uh, persians everybody uh, can get along but of course that is like a dream right because the way the region has been divided for decades uh, especially since the 1940s is not a very promising sign but nonetheless um, lots of problems in all the in, in some of these countries that need fixing there's a financing gap um, will that fuel more radicalism corona plus the you know the war ravaged situations in 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 syria and iraq especially will that lead to a recrudescence of another form of uh, isis lots of questions um uh, remain and i hope that uh, the great intellectuals today dr awad and uh, professor habib will uh, shine light on these problems and uh, perhaps show us uh, what is the simplest uh, solution to all these and why these solutions are so hard to achieve uh, it seems like um, we have been you know um, repeating the same paradigms for decades and have failed so maybe something fresh something new or something coming from the youth like the movement we have seen recently in lebanon for improvement of governance uh, those kind of things give us hope but then uh, reconstruction war and then the regime issues you know governance issues remain so i hope that uh, we can reflect on all these but thank you for giving me this opportunity to open this and welcome to professor habib and to dr awad the, from the jindal global university and we hope to have you here uh, sirs uh, in person once the pandemic abates hopefully in a few months okay thank very you very good. much thank you professor chawla for those insightful opening remarks and for setting the foundation for what our speakers will now talk about so dr awad you may present your screen if you want to yeah. thank you very much uh, for the introductory remarks and thank you for inviting me to the, uh, the middle east institute and thank you sir professor shiri shiri ram chorya and the professor amora i think it will be very difficult for me to speak to the new scholars in the center because of the proximity and commonality we have with the two professors at the general university it will be making it my talk very difficult to uh, to divert from their uh, point of view but i will start uh, teasing your brains in my talk so you will be able to go and do more research and we can argue and we can reach to consensus about the development in the middle east because what you see in the middle east or the cradle of civilization which i call it and that, that is the place where we we all belong to and that's we are proud of from the mesopotamia to all the region to the phoenix to the canine uh, to all that region have shown to the world and contributed to humanity and i think after the ottoman empire or occupation of the arab world we have really went 500 years back and then 100 years under occupation and post independent we have not been able to build up a state of our own and that's i will come and the talk to speak about it then first of all i wanted to come to the uh, to the terminology of the middle east i mean this is the uh, conflicting report being in india because india call it west asia while we still call it at the arab world the middle east and actually this is the name middle east many people think that it has been called by the the colonial britain or it is because of the geography and the maps were drawn by britain in the 18th and 19th century so everything was calculated according to the epicenter of london where they were saying that london is there so there is far east near east and middle east so that was the naming so the term middle east has been there so then the american have come up in the region and they named it uh, i think i lieutenant general strategist he was alfred uh, tire mahan in 1902 he called it the uh, middle east and in that one in particularly he included uh, pakistan afghanistan turkey and iran in the map so you can see the map of the american have seen it and that continue to be the middle east so when we speak of the middle east i am sure that we are trying to speak of the arab world which will include middle east and north african states so in india we call it wana which is west asia north african state and we call it mina in the arab world where middle east and north african state where the new original mina order as, as condaliza rice tried to speak after the uh, in, uh, attack on lebanon 2006 
or we can say what is the new project for the new Middle East order. So we have to speak, when I speak, it is a terms will include all the Arab states because we need to focus on the Arab uh, as a whole entity and then come back to the West Asian development in this part of the world. So the objective of the paper will be that we will discuss on the, uh, the plight of the Arab world, how these things happened in the past. I am sure that you have had enough lecture from Professor Julia and Ambassador Professor Abura on these topics for long, but I, I will highlight it in a, in a very uh, fast way so we don't spend much of the time. Because when the Ottoman Empire uh, fell, it was the Arab world divided by Sykes-Picot and the Sykes-Picot agreement have divided the Arab world into 19 states. And that is the division of the Arab world, which is also uh, have made also the 1917 uh, where Belfort declaration to that the establishment of Israel at the heart of Palestine, which is the main cause of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I have to look into this because it has been the prime focus of most of the Arab nation, the pan-Arabism movement after the two, after independent, the post-Second World War. Most of the Arab leaders, unfortunately, have come on the tanks of the uh, winning uh, allies of the, 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 the World War II allies, where we don't have a democratic setup in the Arab world. Most of these leaders have been brought, and they've been a stooge in the hand of the American and the British and the French, where they have not even been looking after their people uh, affairs. Despite the fact that, this, uh, that there was a trying to build up democracy in the Arab world, but we failed in many fronts, I think the period of Nasser was, uh, Jamal Abdul Nasser was the pan-Arabism period where we tried also during that time to, uh, to the Arab Tvorja forces that the, the slogan was Israel occupation and the plight of the Palestinian and the division of Palestine, which have taken most of the Palestinian 55% and given to the Israeli and 14, 45 was given to the Palestinian by this UN Security Council resolution. Having said that, I would say that the Arab world remained in turmoil because we had a population pump in the Arab world. And then we've seen that there are lots of people are um, between the age of 19 to 29. There was 100 million Arab in that age. And we had almost a 30 million working force in the Arab world during the years of the development <laughs> or the, the, the uh, trying to come up from a feudal society into a modern society where the industrialized society. So that period, which was very crucial for the Arab world, we were unable to, in fact, we failed to transform our society, but we remained that we were tribe, we were, we were ethnic groups, but the, there are lots of commonality among the Arabs. So therefore, when we tried to, uh, to develop all these things, we failed in many fronts. And that is why there was resentment within the Arab world because the manpower in the Arab world have built up from 30 million to 100 million uh, manpower, which is to reckon with. So there was unemployment, there was uh, no uh, uh, place to work. And then there, there was lots of austerity measured and difficulty, economic difficulty, which also, and corruption and malpractice by the leaders, which have led to the resentment against the Arab world. So there was a lots of poverty in the Arab world. We had more than 65 million people poor in 2009 figure I'm giving you. And then we had also the gap between the few food security widened among most of the Arab nations. Uh, movement in the Arab world had nothing to, not much, very limited role to play in the Arab uh, affairs. And we had almost against 55% in the global figure. So. But then at the introduction of political Islam in the Arab world, in fact, the Muslim Brotherhood organization, which was formed by the British and supported by the Gulf countries those days, have been given the upper hand and American also given the Saudi Arabia the upper hand in, in, in spreading Islamization of the world against the uh, communism, because that was the Eisenhower agreement with the monarchy of Saudi Arabia that you, you, you join hand and that I think that thicker than oil was written by Rachel Bronson have talked about this in, at length that the American allowed the Saudi to spread the, the, the Wahhabism all over the world to protect the Arab countries from going into the, the communism. So therefore we have seen all this trouble and all the allies in the Arab world where we have seen. So you see this map, which is showing you from, the, from Morocco, from Mauritania, up to Saudi Arabia and up to uh, the Gulf country is the whole of the Arab world, which has been locked inside that geographical area and remain of, of great importance, not only for the uh, uh, 
for the region, but also for Europe and for the Americans. So it has been of a, a great interest, not because of the population bomb, but because of the oil and security and gas available in the Arab world, where it has been the prime importance for the American foreign policy, for the Western power. Followed, of course, then we have seen with the Israel, uh, and then now we see President Trump himself saying that the Americans are not much depending on the Arab oils nowadays, but now we are more for we are more in the region to protect Israel. So they have used the terrorism as a tool to achieve their political objective in the region. So you can see from the projections of these pictures I am putting for you in the pictures where they, when there is a terrorist in Afghanistan. And they used to call them rebels in Syria or a terrorist in Iraq, but freedom fighter in Libya. But we have seen the kind of situation they have developed in the Arab world and they have created the anarchy in every part of the Arab world. And I think the worst lesson we have learned in history is, uh, is started the Arab security uh, framework, which we failed as an Arab nation to build up, has led to the intervention of the foreign pol powers in the Arab affairs. In fact, it was started with the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, where the Iran-Iraq War, where the uh, Iranian Revolution had come in 1979. And Saddam Hussein of Iraq was uh, promoted by the American and the Gulf country to fight Iranian at that time. And we continue after eight years, and they have signed the agreement, two million people, one million in each side died, and they signed the status quo, what they have been agreed upon in 1971 in Algeria. So that moment, Iraq had the turning point was when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. That was the, I think, the, the starting of the fall of the Arab nation and the more disintegration of the Arab world. Because at that moment, it was the American who interfered along with the allies and liberated Kuwait. And then Iraq was put under sanction. And then we in, to introduced the American, the fifth generation of war affairs, where they have used the, the O and the shock and then the anarchy in the region. So uh, 11 September have come, then, then we had seen invasion of, uh, of uh, Afghanistan, then unilaterally Tony Blair and um, um, George Bush has invaded Iraq and without any sanction from the UN, uh, United Nations Security Council. And then we have noticed that after that, the terrorism have flourished in the region and where all the terrorist organization have gone into the ISIS and, and uh, the uh, uh, Al-Qaeda and all of them both are the same side, the two sides of the same coin. So, the, you know, that was the, fall, the policy of regime change, which have really started in the Arab world with Iraq invasion. So Iraq invasion, it was second on the card was Syria because that was the underline and Colin Powell went to Syria and by president and dictate him what the American want from him to cut relation with Hezbollah and Iran, and also to, to cut relation, dismantle Hezbollah, cut relation with Iran, open the economy, and stop supporting the resistance forces in Iraq. But then there was all this has gone uh, and refused, and then the Syria was targeted by the American, and there were seven countries, the regime changed. And you know all this current situation, the turmoil is nothing in the Arab world but a manifestation of the Western power, and you know about it from the uh, from the what we call the uh, the uh, the clean and break 1996 by Richard Pearl's policy, and we had Judith Onin in 1982. Also, we had spoke about the Israeli Israeli strategy for the 19th century, and we had also what we call him the uh, Condoleezza Rice herself, Brzezinski himself project. Also, then till 2002 till 2000, where they spoke of the invasion of Iraq. So all this dragging and drafting of the Middle East was part of the American foreign policy in the region. And we must remember that in Iraq, that become the hub center for all the terrorist organization. And I have particularly put this picture of Abu Ghraib because that will give you the reason why people went into more terrorists. And 19 of the ISIS founders, in fact, were in Abu Ghraib and Copper and um, uh, camps and uh, and the, these are all the camps where the American troops were uh, were there and they were kept more than 26,000 inmates inhumanated by all means of the American troops and they have been raped, they have been tortured, they have been uh, they, anything you name it and they have been doing inhuman behavior they have done and nobody was allowed to enter into those places. So therefore this cultural of terrorism have started with in Afghanistan, continued in the Arab world, spread into Syria and Iraq, 
and then followed by to the North African state when Libya, where Libya has been destroyed totally. And then we had the, uh, uh, the Yemen and uh, most of the uh, Arab Afghan who has gone back from Afghanistan, they become the Mujahideen and they have gone back to their country to start their sleeping cell. Now then we saw the, uh, since you spoke of the to Turkey, Turkey played a major role in the Arab Spring, which we call it the Arab Spring or West, we call it the Autumn Spring because there was nothing spring on that anyway. anyway. Because what happened was that there was a meeting between the Erdogan and the Muslim Brotherhood organization and Jeff Filchman from the Deputy Secretary of the United States. They sat in Ankara, they decided what would be the future of the Arab world, and that was decided upon that we should have a changing of the regime on the Arab Spring, let it start it in Tunisia, and it started in Tunisia. Most of the Arab leaders, which were pro American camp, have run away or they have collapsed, except those socialist countries where the Syria has not been able, they have failed to do so. And there, where the Muslim Brotherhood, as an alternative force, was introduced into the region. And Erdogan mm -hmm. himself, the de facto Khalifa, he has been, uh, the, himself is the uh, spreading this uh, Islamization in the world. Nothing but because he is doing the American agenda for the Arab world, for the Muslim world, and for the European as well, because that's on the wider perspective of we look at the development. I put this picture here to show you the former American, last American ambassador to Syria, where he was, uh, Robert Ford, where he was with the Free Syrian Army they created, and the Free Syrian Army was with Al-Nusra Front, and Al-Nusra Front leader was with Al-Qaeda. -Al so you can see that even the same group is the same terrorist. So they have created for you an alternative force to double the Syrian regime because they knew that is the hypocrisy of the American policy. So there have been the terrorists have been funded. They have been giving the money to go and attack, whether it is in Syria, whether it is in Libya, whether it is now in, in Armenia and Azerbaijan, because that is the same group. So if you look at the picture of the Middle East, you'll be totally confused. Turkey is against Syria and in Syria. But they are uh, with Russia in, in, in Libya, against Syria and Russia and Syria. But they are against uh, a, a Russia in Azerbaijan and Armenia. While they are supporting the Shia Azerbaijan, but they are fighting with the, with the, uh, with the Sunni missionaries from Syria. So Iran is with Armenia. So if you want to, to take a clear picture of the Middle East, welcome to West Asia and Middle East. There is no clear picture. You will be more confused to understand the Middle East. So we need to understand the development in the Middle East. Is it seriously, are we really the interfighting among the Arabs and the Western nations is meant that we are going to develop or more wars, more selling of arms and industry will be flourish and poor men will get killed and the Arab world will be totally disintegrated. So I think these are the issues where we can focus on it and talk. And these are some of the picture we can show you before the Western democracy came to our countries. And then, and then after the Western democracy with the ISIS introductions that Iraq, you can see Libya, you can see Yemen, nobody talks of Yemen and also Syria is the same picture. So all these pictures give you the clear indication of the actual and sinister plan of destroying the Arab world, destroying the within these states of the Arab world, so you can have a collapse from within and you can impose your dictation to these Arab countries to fall in line with the American and Israeli project for the next stage. So maybe we had a Nakba of the, 20, the 100, 100 years ago by the first Sykes Pico, but now we are, for, we, are, we are facing the second Nakba of Palestinian, maybe of the Arab world, because that's the stage where the American dominance in the region for Israel is a prime important for completely destroying the whole uh, infrastructure of this Arab world and causing all this chaos. So these are some of the picture. So I, this is Syria, where, where we are now more focused on my country because Syria is the place where we had more than 171,400, according to UN uh, figures, uh, terrorists have come from 103 countries have come into Syria and I have get the, got the figure here. You can see each country. These are figures from the UN, which you have seen different countries and you can see it from Saudi Arabia. We had more than 24,500 24, terrorists. From Turkey, we had 25,000. 
25,800 terrorists. So all this figure, you can look at it later on and find out that most of these nations have played a major role in sending their mercenaries to fight inside Syria, including 30,000 mercenaries from Western Europe, Blue Eyes Boys and all these people have come to this region to fight. And now we have more than 55,000 of them remain in Idlib and where Turkey is trying to uh, get them back into uh, Libya to fight the Libyan uh, forces uh, along with the Turkey and also helping them now to fight alongside with the, uh, with the, uh, with the Azerbaijan against Armenia. So these are the terrorists have been used and some of the terrorists we must also, Erdogan have used these terrorists to allow them to be smuggled along with the Syrian uh, migrants who have left to Europe. So you can see them. Some of these pictures show you those terrorists who were in Syria enjoying and parading with their guns. But when they went to Europe, they wore the t-shirt and the civilian clothes and they have, you know, uh, hided among the, among the immigrants. And these are the sleeping cell where Europe will pay the price for accepting all these terrorist organization inside where Erdogan trying to blackmail them. Why Erdogan is the question, why Erdogan have shifted his point to the pan-Islamic slogan that he is talking. Because Erdogan himself, he realized that uh, Europe will never accept uh, Turkey as a, a European Union member. So therefore he thought of uh, riding on the Arabs back and Islam, he can be uh, able to, uh, you know, revive the Ottoman Empire and be the new Khalifa in the region. And that's why he's spreading his arm, not only inside the, the North African Arabian state or in the, the West Asia, but he may come even to India, even to China, because he claimed some part of them and even the Uyghurs are part of the Chinese, uh, of the Turkish Empire, where he brought more than 5,000 and he put them in the northern part of Syria and they're fighting side by side with the terrorist ISIS. And that is where all this. So. The new project of the Middle East, which has been projected by the American uh, uh, general, I think in 2006, he has come up with this map of uh, Ralph Peters. He have come with this map of the new Middle East. He have seen how much we should disintegrate this part of the world and make it into small states. And then we can, on ethnic and on religious line, because he thought the, uh, the sykes Pico did not give the actual map of the Arab world of the division and all this suffering of the countries is because of the political division of the Arab world and the interest of France and Germany and, 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 the, and USSR that time and even, uh, and even uh, French. So he said that was a politically divided, it was not equally divided on ethnic lines. So they wanted to divide more the Arab world into ethnic lines because a small state as, as more, America is a having the phobia of a big states. So they always like to break it into small states they can manage. So small states can be managed manageable more for the American or for the Western power. So the whole idea is to have the greater Israel. And that is the project for the King David Empire, where they have speaking of the Euphrates from Euphrates to Nile, where the, where the Israelis, the new uh, greater Israel should be created in this part of the world. So having spoken all on these lines, I think it is a high time we should speak now of the wider dimension before we close on, I have to focus more into the reason why we have all this problem beside the, in, the interfighting, beside the religious re angle, beside the economy, beside everything there. There is a Silk Road, there is a, a wider American and the great powers fighting between the American and the Chinese and the Russians and the India now is on the focus. Why? Because there is a two different routes have been developed in this part of the, the Silk Route from, from China, which is going into 62 countries. And you can see from the yeah. diagram, most of these countries, which the, yeah. the Silk Route passed through, yeah. it has to be going yeah. through. Yeah. It will be, most of these countries are under trouble because the Americans are not happy with that. They are countering and thwarting the Silk Route. While we can see the development of the other route, which is trying to take place the north-south corridors where India will be playing a major role in this. So you can see, and now I wanted to focus more onto the Azerbaijan. You can see the line from India to Iran, Azerbaijan to Russia. So Azerbaijan fighting is mainly because of the pipelines and because of the, the gas is nothing to do with the religious angle where we're trying to focus in other part and they were saying it is Sunni Shia area, there's nothing to do. It's just their interest where they have to be. So there is, there is a question of containing China 
uh, and encircling Russia, not allowing Russia to grow up bigger and making more problem. And Turkey also trying to blackmail Russia in the future negotiation on the future of Syria and on the future of Libya because of their uh, conflict of interest between the Russian and the uh, Turkish on these two issues. So the whole issue should be taken from this angle. I wanted to see or speak also a word about the Lebanon development. I think Beirut uh, port blowing up the, the Beirut uh, port is, has something to do very much with the pipelines, with the new routes, with the new formation. You know, when you paralyze Beirut, you have Haifa. Haifa will be developed by whom? By the UAE. The UAE pumping the money into it so that there will be pipelines into Europe from Haifa. And then there is a new pipeline which comes from Saudi Arabia, from Emirates through Jordan and going to, to Haifa. And then from there, it will go to the Europeans. So you are making a new alternative route to the Silk Route of the, uh, the Chinese. And that involvement, if particularly you wanted to give the dominance of Israel in the region at the cost of the Arabs. So when you talk of UAE or Bahrain as an example, why they have joined the Israeli normalization or peace deal. I don't know why we call it peace deal, by the way. They have never been at war with Israel. There is no war, there are not proximity. They have never sent a soldier to fight with. It is simply a compulsion and compelled by the American to sign the agreement with Israel for normalization because they wanted access to these places where they will get the money back and they will pump into their infrastructure for the Israeli development, for those pipelines to go to, to the European and to counter the Russian pipelines from that side. So therefore, it's a conflict of interest where all the wars have been in the world rather than the conflict of any other reason where we see there is no ideology anymore in the world. So nobody fight an ideology, it is fought in the interest. Finally, I think uh, India and the Arab world, I think we should, we should, we should see the India uh, and this uh, part, we saw that India is quite good relation with most of the people in the region, with Israel, with the Arab world, so that kept equal distance, recognized Palestine as a Palestinian state, so the first non-Arab country to do so, open an embassy for them. And there is also new, the Indian security, energy security, Indian diaspora in the Arab world, and the, the money comes from there, the, the revenue. We have 8 million Indian in the Arab countries where we have $55 billion annually coming to India. And you have most of the more than 14 million Indian every year are in the Gulf state. So there is a major interest for India to play a proactive role in the future of the region, not only with the Iranian uh, factors and implication of the Iran, but there will be also the instability in this part of the world. India will be directly affected by this. So what we can call of the pandemic virus, I could be that we will call it the pandemic is a virus. Yes, there was a virus which we have the new battle zone. There will be a new formation, it's a new era. There will be new structuring of the world, of the new world order, where we will see many of the reshaping of the new world order. There will be rise of terrorism in uh, South Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan again, and maybe in, in, in South of China and the uh, Jing, Jing, uh, the, the Uyghur region, where you will see more of uh, terrorism because terrorism is a tool, I said, and it has been used and there is enough mercenaries and privatization of the war. So therefore, there will be more Arab countries falling in the line of signing agreement with Israel because of the American pressure, nothing to do with the Palestinian group. Palestinians will continue their resistance. There is a resistance arch between Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, Iraq, Iran, which is the is part of the Israeli-American project in the region. And there where you have to focus more why nobody wanted this war to stop also. So I end up here and I hope we will be able to uh, take question and answer. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Awad, for those that very insightful presentation. And I'm sure many people will have questions for you towards the end of the webinar. Now, uh, Second speaker is Dr. Kamil Habib, who will be delivering distinguished remarks, and he will be focusing on the current political situation in Lebanon. Dr. Habib has been the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Administration, and uh, Political Science at the Lebanese University in Beirut since 2013, 
and is an expert on international relations and the Middle East and politics. He is also associated with the Fawd Shehab Command and Staff College of the Lebanese Army, the Journal of Law and Political Science, the Lebanese University, Rana University, France, and the Arab Association of Political Science, among others. He has previously been associated with the Notre Dame University, St. Mary University, Mount St. Vincent University, Dalhousie University, and Acadia University in Canada. Additionally, uh, Dr. Habib was the advisor to the Lebanese Ministry of Culture and Higher Education between 1995 and 1996. Dr. Habib has also authored and co-authored a number of books on international relations, the Middle East and Lebanon. Today, he will be presenting on the current political situation in Lebanon. And we are honored to have you with us today. So uh, you are on mute, sir. Unmute yourself. في زر في زر عندك وين أحمر بشك بس عليه مشان تشيلو السبيكر. Unmute. من تحت بس تحت السكرين من تحت. Down in the screen. Unmute yourself. You cannot do it from your side, Sears? Uh, no, sir. It should be to the bottom left of your screen. على الجانب okay. الأيسر the screen تبعك من تحت. Unmute. IT, can you unmute? Dr. Kamil, can you see it at the low, at the left side of your screen, down? Unmute the bottom of the mic. Red bottom. I can unmute him. No, no. No, no. IT, can you unmute? I think. Uh, Dr. Kamil, can you hear me? You, you, you just see at your screen down on the left side on the screen, there is a button which is showing you that there is a mic mute. Cross, press on it and remove the unmute button. Unmute yourself. شيل عليك بس كبس عليه مشان تشيل السماعة تطلع معك الصوت. على السكرين تبع على الفيديو على ال على السكرين تبع اللابتوب. تحت شيء تحت الكل على يسار. أيوة. Yes yes. إذا هو. Now we can hear you now. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, today, uh, well, it, it seems from what I gather so far, I cannot draw for, uh, for the audience and uh, for the panel uh, a rosy picture of what's going on. It is uh, pessimistic and the future is very unpredictable, especially when it comes to a region like the Middle East. I would start at the outset uh, by saying that today we are commemorating the 151st uh, anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. And uh, this us give us here in the Middle East, we, we celebrate this, uh, this occasion with hope and uh, optimism. I hope optimism will, will grow not only for uh, Lebanon, but also for the Middle East and the whole world. Um, Thank you, Dr. Awad, for giving us this uh, review, uh, historic and the current of what's going on in the Middle East nowadays. I would say uh, that there are that there are two Middle. Uh, I would like to thank the Center for Middle East Studies at General University and uh, all the efforts made in, in order for me to participate in this uh, discussion. Uh, I would say that there are two East, maximalist Middle East and minimalist Middle East. The maximalist Middle East is the one uh, from Afghanistan to, to Morocco. The minimalist Middle East is the one that uh, uh, 
specifically Palestine and the lands around the Palestine, namely Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, uh, uh, and so on. Um, yes, I agree that the Middle East, uh, that before the interference in the Middle East in the mid 19th centuries, the, the, the pictures in the Middle East or the situation in the Middle East was to a great table. Then the so-called the Eastern questions, which means that uh, Western uh, European countries give themselves the right to, to, to interfere in, in Lebanon. Uh, there was no Lebanon at, the, at, at this uh, stage, but this area, Lebanon and Syria, in order to divide the, the area into, uh, into place of interest uh, for, uh, uh, for them. Um, yes, living in a very anarchic uh, world, um, especially with the President Trump as the president of the White House, who didn't give the Arab any chance to uh, to see the United States as a neutral, playing in neutral between the Arabs and the Israelis, especially when he, when he recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and he recognized the annexation of Israel of the Golan Heights. And, uh, and, and after, after all of that, he introduced the so-called fiasco of the century, which means that there is no Palestinian state, and the, the Arabs must, must agree to a, a, a Pax uh, Hebrica, is a peace to the Israeli uh, viewpoint. Um, with respect to the, uh, to the to the recognition made by United Arab Emirates and Bahrain uh, to Israel, they recognize Israel as a state in the Middle East. This means nothing because the the uh, the center of the problem is in Palestine. Unless you find solution to the Palestinian questions, uh, that is will be no in the Middle East. The Arab thousand two introduce uh, the uh, the so called initiative for peace according to the formula land for peace. Uh, Israel uh, refuses to uh, to uh, to implement Security Council resolution, uh, especially one nine four, which means that uh, which gives the Palestinians refugees the right to return to Palestine. Uh, never retreated from the land occupied in 1987, and it was forced into in year 2000 to withdraw from the Lebanese land after the Lebanese resistance uh, attacks against the Israeli uh, army. It was the first time that Israel was forced to withdraw from Arab land unconditionally. Um, uh, with respect to the uh, current situation in Lebanon and Israel, uh, I think what to the Beirut report on 4th of August uh, this 2003 was not a coincidence. The Mr. Trump's reaction, first reaction to what happened was a, a, the Beirut port what was hit by either a rock or a bomb, a rocket or a bomb. Um, uh, Israel uh, hesitate to to uh, declare its responsibility for what happened because of the disaster that happened to Beirut to the uh, uh, destroy half of the city and kill 200 people innocent people and so on. I accuse Israel of being behind this attack so far. Um, uh, even Netanyahu two days ago he was uh, uh, talking about about Hezbollah depot of weapons in, inside the Beirut, and uh, he was talking about uh, the second explosion that may take place in the city. So the question is, who was responsible for the first explosion? Why Netanyahu was talking about second explosion with a fear in the city of Beirut? In uh, 2016, um, the Lebanese parliament elected General Sharon as the President of the Republic. 
this election follow the uh, agreement, nuclear agreement between Iran and the uh, uh, plus one power. And uh, the situation in Lebanon and Syria uh, moving uh, forward toward more stability uh, at the time. And then what happened is that uh, Paul Trump was elected as president of the United States. Uh, president Michel Aoun, uh, there is no, uh, uh, it's not, it's not, uh, uh, it's not, uh, to, to be honest, this, uh, General Aoun uh, supports the Lebanese resistance and supports uh, a good relations with, uh, based on mutual understanding and mutual, mutual respect. And he uh, made agreement with the Lebanese forces uh, uh, another political Lebanese political foe to to the free patriotic movement led by President Aung. He also uh, made an understanding, uh, achieve an understanding with the future movement led by Saad Al Hariri. The situation in Lebanon was forward, and the country uh, was uh, to a certain degree stable. In 1917. The Lebanese army and the Lebanese resistance led by Hezbollah uh, were able to achieve against the terrorist group in the Bika Valley uh, in August to, uh, 2017. Then this, the achievement of understanding between General Aoun and the future movement and on one hand and the Lebanese on the other hand was uh, failed in 2018 to the fact that the year that uh, President Donald Trump withdraw from the agreement with Iran. Then the, the situation began to be to be uh, very uh, unstable uh, since uh, since then. Uh, the the president tried to uh, form a cabinet. Uh, and it was very difficult for him at this uh, at this point. Uh, then uh, in 2000, uh, uh, end of 2019, uh, a movement was called uprising, called revolution, called movement, uh, took place in the streets of Beirut. It has nothing to do with the revolution or movement or uprising, because these people who demonstrated in Beirut demonstrated against Hezbollah and Michel and General Michel Aoun. And they have no political platform. The political program builds a new state in Lebanon. Our, the problem, the main in the Middle East is that we, the Arabs failed to build the state, to build a modern state in the region of the world. And I support building a strong state why, by a strong state, I mean not a dictatorship state. I mean a, sta a, de a real democratic state with a real national unity. This is something we do not have enough. The people they affiliate themselves with their families, with their religious group, but they never affiliated themselves with the country. Loyalty and affiliation with Lebanism or Lebanon uh, is very weak. National unity in Lebanon uh, is very weak. Uh, the downfall of the Lebanese pound against the dollar, it's not a coincidence. Uh, the the so-called Zuama or warlord, warlords in Lebanon, they uh, withdraw the money and the elsewhere in, in the money they they stole from the Lebanese. Uh, so um, now we are very poor. It happens in a few months. Nothing happened by the uh, And it's not a coincidence that the United Arab Emirates and uh, Bahrain Kingdom recognize the right of Israel to exist. But as I say earlier at the, at the outset, these recognitions will not solve the problem in the Middle East. It's a band aid solution to a, great, to a very protracted problem. Unless a solution based on justice to the Palestinian people take place, then the Middle East will never experience a peace. Yes, Bernard Lewis in 2003 uh, uh, introduced a, 
introduce uh, a solution to the problem of the world by dividing each into three or or more than three states uh, according to the ethnic or religious line. So he proposed uh, that Lebanon will be divided into five or six states in order in order to uh, to justify the existence of Israel as a state for the Jewish people. If this is the case, then uh, the so-called Palestinian Arab of 1948 will be transferred to or uh, Lebanon, and we will receive more refugees from Palestine, and then uh, Palestine will become a, a Jewish uh, entity only for the uh, for the Jewish people. And uh, I, I, I myself make a distinction between Judaism and Zionism. Uh, and I, in, in my, in my terminology, I have nothing against Judaism, but I would say that every Zionist is a Jew, but that Jew is a Zionist. However, now, after 10 years of negotiation, sponsoring by the United Nations, Lebanon and Israel, uh, uh, achieve a framework for negotiating to delineate or to uh, to uh, to draw a line, a demarcation line into the sea and land. Israel still occupied uh, Bazerak, uh, Sheba, Shebans, uh, Shuba Hills, and the eastern side of the uh, town in South Lebanon. When Israel withdraw in 2000, in the year 2000. According to the blue line, the blue line is the line where the Israeli stop withdrawing, and it's not the line that uh, uh, that uh, represents the border, uh, divide the borders between Lebanon and, and historic Palestine. According to the to the new com uh, uh, of 1923. Uh, during the French mandate in Lebanon and the British mandate in, in Palestine, where uh, the 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 border line was drawn between uh, between Lebanon and Palestine after the creation of Lebanon in the Great Lebanon or the Grand Liban in 1920. Yes, uh, there is no such thing as human rights in the especially in Israel because Israel is not a democratic state. Democracy only for the Western Jews, not even for the Eastern Jews, because there is this this uh, system in Israel is uh, is similar to the apartheid regime in South uh, in South Africa. Um, uh, what happened in, in uh, nothing, as I said earlier, nothing happens by coincidence in this part of the world, when the so-called uh, Arab uh, winter or Arab spring <laughs> started in 2011. A war, a war against what is left of Arab dignity and Arab honor. It was a war between international terrorism supported by the United States, Israel, and Britain against against the, the Arab honor and the Arab dignity represented by Syria and Iraq, and especially by Syria. Israel and the United States and Turkey reach an understanding. Unless Syria is destroyed, there will be no, no uh, Pax Israeli or uh, Pax Hebraica in the Middle East. And the Lebanese national resistance, and to a certain degree, Iraq, are the ones that stand stiff against the Israeli, uh, uh, the Israeli uh, uh, ambition in the uh, in the Eastern Front. So uh, after ten years of destruction of the city, and uh, after many years of imposing sanction against Syria uh, and Lebanon, we still believe that the question in the Middle East is the question of existence. Palestine is not a real estate issue. We are not 
Israel is not an enemy of Lebanon and Syria because Israel is a, occupy a few kilometers of Palestine. It is, it is a conflict, not a crisis. It is a conflict between two civilizations, two, uh, uh, between the people, according to Arnold 20, between the people who have the right of their land and those who came to occupy their land. I believe, yes, I suppose in the Middle East. My speech now seems of date, as if someone wants to destroy Israel in order to achieve a peace in the Middle East. This is in the final, final, the other final, uh, at, at the end of the race. But in the meantime, if Israel wants a peace with us, Israel must withdraw from the Lebanese land, from Syrian land, and must recognize the right of the Palestinian people to their state as they want it. We support what the, Palestine, what the Palestinian people want. When Mahmoud Abbas, the president of uh, or the Ramallah, uh, uh, said that the only alternative to negotiation is negotiation, we say no, sir. The only alternative to negotiation is to fight, to fight the occupation and to force Israel to recognize, to recognize the right of the Palestinians. Ladies and gentlemen, the Middle East, the Middle East will be a very unstable state for many years to come. There will be no peace in the Middle East and unless and Israel will accept Security Council Resolution 242-425-1701, which call on Israel to withdraw from Arab land in order to achieve a peace. Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. Jerusalem is the capital of Shin and Muslim Arabs. I take and, and uh, I, I must add with the following. India is a great regional state in Western Asia or in Southeast. The relationship between India and India and Israel is a new one. Hence, India can play, New Delhi can play a, a, a constructive role, probably in bringing the Arab and the Israeli once again to the negotiation. We cannot wait for Washington to decide uh, our destiny in the Middle East. Other, other uh, great nations such as India, China, Russia must help people in the Middle East to rebuild their state and to achieve some kind of, of stability uh, and, and the peace. The situation in Lebanon is a phoenix. It's just like phoenix. Lebanon will, will uh, emerge out of this crisis uh, more strong than ever before. And uh, I hope that Washington and Israel stop, must stop battling with the Lebanese uh, crisis. Uh, as, I, as you know, David Hill last week uh, said that we pay $10 billion in Lebanon, we invest $10 billion in Lebanon uh, in order uh, uh, to, uh, to show everyone that Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. $10 billion, United States invest in Lebanon, paid to various Lebanese factions who are against Hezbollah uh, in order to, uh, to reduce Hezbollah power in the, inside the country. Well, it's all in the eye of the beholder. Hezbollah for us is a national resistance, Lebanese is a Lebanese act in the whole country against Israeli and terrorist group. And uh, whether or not Lebanon will be stay, it will be more stable in the future, it remains to be. Let us hope, as Mahatma Gandhi taught us to hope a long time ago. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. For those very important things.
especially about what can be done and what India can do. But now we have a few questions from the people who are part participants in this meeting. So Tamana, if you will. Good evening, everybody. I would like to thank all our speakers for their very informative uh, remarks. And uh, there have been uh, a few questions from the audience. So, um, so the first question is um, to both our uh, distinguished speakers tonight. Um, so my question is regarding the future of Turkish neo-Ottomanism and considering how Turkey has been investing a lot of time, money, energy in a lot of uh, aspects in the Middle East, particularly Libya, Syria, as well as supporting the Muslim Brotherhood and now even the new uh, conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So considering uh, the economic difficulties that Turkey has been facing, how feasible do you think Erdogan's uh, approach of new Ottomanism in the region is? Um, both of you can uh, serve, both of you can answer this question. Thank you. Dr. Kamil. Okay, well, go ahead, go ahead. That's no, fine, just continue, it's fine. I was listening to you. I'll... Please, go ahead. Uh, Atatürk, the founder of the new Turkey, moved Turkey in 2019-23 from being the first, the first nation in the East to become the last nation in the West. When Erdogan failed to, uh, to, uh, uh, to bring, uh, to be, uh, for Turkey to be a, a member in the, in the European Union, now he, he starts battling with his supporting terrorist group. He starts using the Palestinian question in order to, to show the Arabs that he supported the Palestinian uh, people uh, in order to make uh, uh, leeway for himself in Egypt and so on. He failed in Egypt. He failed in Syria. He failed in Libya. Why? Because you cannot, you cannot, Protect your interest in these countries by investing on mercenaries. He's using mercenaries. If he is, if he is uh, uh, powerful, why don't he? Why doesn't he use uh, the uh, the Turkish army in Libya, in Egypt, in Syria, and so on? He use only mercenaries. You cannot. You cannot uh, uh, achieve anything by using mercies uh, in these lands. He created the predicament to himself. He has a problem, so many problems with everyone, from Washington to Moscow to Anau to Damascus. Uh, so uh, that predicament will uh, will uh, will show when there is the failure of his of his policies uh, whether at the international scene or at the regional scene um, uh, Erdogan uh, wants to achieve the so-called great great uh, uh, Turkish nation and I think this is a big dream for him that he will never achieve or he will never break into reality. Thank you. I think I will start from what Dr. Kamil finished and I will speak on the issue of Turkey. We know that Turkey is a member of NATO. So being a member of NATO is an ally with the United States. So I don't yes. see Turkey doing anything in the region without on, uh, on its own independently, but it is in fact done on behalf of the American uh, project in this part of the world. And that I can divide it into two, because a strong Turkey in Europe, ailing Europe, nobody wants Turkey at this stage. So therefore, this integration of Turkey is very much in the card. So Erdogan is playing in the hands of his adversary, where he will be bringing Turkey to the fold, and he will do it so. From zero, as Dr. Kamil said, from zero problem with neighbor, with problem with everybody. So that is the policy. So. He's tried to expand in, non, in the Mediterranean because he wanted to uh, put problem for the European Union. You know, anybody who challenged that petrodollars is at risk, whether it is Europe, whether it is Asia, whether it is China, whether it's Venezuela, whether it is Indonesia, name it, and anybody who already have a problem with the United States 
that America will not allow any currency, including the euro, to challenge the American dollar. So Islamophobia and, and problem with the mercenaries inside Europe is part of putting pressure in Europe and also men, men, denying the, uh, the, the pipelines from Russia to Europe will force the European countries to buy the American oil and gas at American terms. This is one. So Turkey trying to expand on those direction and trying to use the mercenaries on the issues of trying to stabilize or establish its empire. I said it in my speech that uh, Turkey is riding on the Arab backs on the name of Islam, which has nothing to do with their project at all in this Islam. Uh, uh, Erdogan knows everything but Islam. So he used the Islamic, uh, you know, flag to make himself as the new Khalifa because he knew that it was denied by European Union to be a member of not uh, of EU. And then he felt that his, his root is in Asia. So how to spread in Asia is to bring back the Islamization and the Islamic That's flag probably. where he can play this his own card. Therefore, uh, the, uh, Turkey is at risk, and Turkey is considered to be the state-sponsored terrorism. If we wanted to discuss Turkey's or terrorism as a whole, it is number one country. Uh, Turkey opened its full border, 940 kilometers with Syria. The total infrastructure for training terrorists, and they have come from all over the world. Name anywhere in the world. They even ask anybody, any country, each intellectual, each intelligence in those countries, each they will tell you they have taken the flight from uh, London to Ankara, and from Ankara they took by road, went into Syria, through the border into Syria and Iraq. Therefore, the whole world knows uh, the plan because they wanted Turkey to fall. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I think uh, you have highlighted some very, very important aspects, particularly the mercenary aspect, which shows how Turkey does not have uh, the human capital to finance such interventions which is making everywhere and not just um, a lot of islamic but also a lot of western scholars have spoken about how turkey's rejection as a western country kind of forced erdogan to play this islamic card and use the arab and islamic aspect to make inroads into the middle east and uh, there have been a few other questions regarding the same so i will uh, read those out as well regarding turkey Zeus asks, how do you see the escalation between Turkey and Greece playing out? How far will Turkey go in its claims? Since they have already agreed uh, to a NATO deal to avoid escalation in the Mediterranean, do you think Turkey will be satisfied and will stop over here or will it try to make more, uh, create more problems vis-a-vis uh, -vis Greece in the Mediterranean? Um, <clears throat> there is conflict of interest with uh, Turkey and Greece go back 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago. Um, there is also conflict of interest between France and Turkey in the Levant. If we, in order for us uh, to consider the French initiative toward Lebanon after the attack on the port on the 4th of August 2020, uh, I think it's a part of also part and partial of it uh, is a conflict of interest between France, Macron, and uh, uh, Erdogan, president of Turkey. So uh, the question is, to what extent can Turkey can go far with that policy um, of, uh, of, of benefits? Erdogan put in his country in, in various predicaments with it's with Russia, with Syria, with Lebanon, with uh, so many, with Libya, with Egypt, with Saudi Arabia, even because now uh, there is now a problem between Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, and Turkey, who will become the Khalifa of the of the of the Muslim uh, uh, world. So the whole thing is very anarchic. The picture is very complicated. And the problems are very protracted. So. The questions for us as Arabs, if you want to ask questions directly to me and Dr. Awad, uh, to what extent or how can we benefit this conflict of interest between France and Turkey or between Greece and Turkey? Uh, it remains to be seen, but I would, I would say the following. Um, uh, contrary to, to Turkish policy, France, doesn't have an ambition to 
Lebanon in Syria. As Mr. Macron said many times, that wants is to see Lebanon stable. Yes, France has some interest in, in Lebanon uh, and in Syria. But this interest may work for the benefit of Lebanon and Syria on one side and France on the other, uh, on the other side. Um, it, it, uh, can Turkey be, what, what Erdogan wants? I mean, this is a big question. He failed, as I said earlier, he failed in many places. Question what he wants. Turkey, he, he, he under, his, under his leadership, Turkey became door for terrorist groups to move from Europe towards Syria. So now uh, unstable Syria means unstable Turkey. Unstable Syria means unstable the whole Levant and the whole Middle East. This is not a, a small issue because the terrorist groups, after they were destroyed in Syria, they are, now they are trying to go back to their native countries, some of them in Western Europe, and this will be they will become destabilizing factors in these countries. So who's responsible for that is Mr. Erdogan. So I don't, I, it, it is, for me, it is a, a very sensitive issue how a country, uh, a member, which is a member in the United Nations, support terrorism so clearly. I mean, you know, there is no, it's not ambiguous anymore. Turkey is a terrorist state supporting terrorism everywhere in the world. Thank you. I think that's a very interesting point because we knew that the state sponsored terrorism and the selectivity of the United States in fighting terrorism has been ignoring the Turkish card has been played in this part. And I talked of the Mediterranean turbulent water where I spoke of the Turkish uh, uh, ambition plan of denying the pipelines to go also from Europe from, to European and destabilize their supply routes uh, from, from Libya, from uh, uh, Egypt, uh, maybe future of from, from Lebanon or could be from Israel, Haifa. So all this have to fall in the line of the uh, interest of, he wanted to grab the oil in that part of the world. And the first war, war between the two countries was in 1892, and then the second one was 1917 till 1922. And you know that the first dispatch of the, the refugees have come to Syria from Armenia and genocide by the Turk and also from the Greek. In fact, we received the first, we were the first country to receive refugees from these two countries. So the Turkey uh, interest now, Erdogan being dreaming of being the Khalifa, he think that Ummah and he lost the empire of Ottoman Empire. So he think that all this is belong to him and he said it. Wherever my, my, my army can reach, it is my land. So therefore, he had that ambition, and he think that a small country like Greece cannot fight him, so he can defeat them. But remember, both of them also not to allies, and that is why the American putting pressure on Erdogan. So Erdogan is not acting on the national interests of Turkey. In the contrary, he is being used as a stooge by the American to do their dirty job in the region, because America wants a watchdog. He is the only watchdog. He's the only one trusted now. Could be Israel later. But is the only one trusted to do the, the dirty job for the American. And therefore, he is destabilizing the region and he is responsible for the mess created in the Middle East. But, I mean, he's a, a first, first, uh, first degree murder, or I call him. He is one of the causing of all the murder in the Arab world and all the Syrian and the Arab blood is in his own hand. It's true. Thank you for that, sir. Um, there's another question regarding Turkey, which is actually very interesting because it uh, features in India. So, um, Danit, I'm sorry, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, is asking how Erdogan's efforts of, you know, courting Pakistan and getting the support of Pakistan for its um, neo-Ottomanism, how will that affect the Kashmiri Muslims? Will he be able to get Indian Muslims um, to support his policy of neo-Ottomanism and to recognize himself as the new Ummah 
of uh, the Islamic world? Do you think he'll be able to get the Indian support from the Muslims? And if he does, how will the situation impact uh, Kashmir? Since Erdogan has publicly expressed concern for Kashmir, even in the UN, how do you think Erdogan's policy on Kashmir will play out? I think I can take this question being living in India, I'll, I'll take the uh, permission from Dr. Kalila, Kamila and I will answer it because I have been following this development very uh, clearly on the Erdogan and the uh, Imran Khan. The fact is that uh, the second most populated Islamic, state, Islamic country is Pakistan after Indonesia. So therefore, there is always a sympathy wave he wanted to create. So by creating a sympathy wave among the Muslim that he is supporting the Kashmiri, he's trying to weave uh, a way, uh, weave the, 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 the Pakistani toward his side and toward his ambition. I don't think any Muslim in, the, in India, Indian Muslim are Indian first and then they are Muslim. And they have proved, I mean, throughout the centuries. I remember during the Al-Qaeda cultural jihadists in Afghanistan, not a single Indian joined Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, by the way. And I can, even then when ISIS, we had only a few people who had the access of the Turkish kind of Islamic and they were able to be taken into Turkey and they put them into, and these are less than 100 in number. So Turkey is uh, trying to, find the way of, of promoting the Islamization, promoting this Islamic wave. But he is doing the, he is playing the wrong uh, card and in the wrong hands, because neither the uh, Muslim in India recognize even the, the, the claim of Pakistan on Kashmir, because Jammu and Kashmir is a victim of colonization. The partition in the subcontinent is a victim of colonization, and we cannot correct the, 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 this mistake by giving part of India or part of India to Pakistan. What is you needed to do at this stage is to make sure that there is integrity and no, no terrorism come to this part of the world. What Turkish is trying to have is a sleeping cell all over this region because he thinks that by using, as Dr. Kamil said, by using all these terrorists and mercenaries, he's trying to achieve his political goal. But I think he is heading for a disaster in his own country because Turkey is a heterogeneous society and multi-diversity, multicultural, and they are the first to fall if anything happened inside Turkey rather than outside. I don't think there is any kind of a coalition or cohesion between Turkey and Pakistan in this region because none of them will accept each other strategically. Thank you. Thank that. you. That's enough. Um, Dr. Habib, would you like to add something? Uh, I would say that it is very ambiguous at this moment to see if, if Erdogan is playing the card of Kashmir against India or against Pakistan. And the, 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 this is not clear for me. I, I wanna, that's why I, uh, I couldn't answer these questions, but I'm not aware of the issue uh, that far. But uh, once when I was in Beirut, I asked the ambassador of Pakistan the following question. I asked him, would the Pakistan agree to a referendum in Kashmir and accept the result of that referendum? Um, and he didn't answer that question. But uh, does Erdogan see Pakistan as, uh, as uh, an enemy, as a competitor in the Islamic world or not? Uh, and, and, and probably Dr. Awad will answer this question, how could India benefit from uh, from the uh, that position of Turkey, I guess, on, on the issue of Kashmir? I don't have the answer, sorry. Um, thank you, sir. No issues. I, um, Dr. Awad answered it very comprehensively. Um, I am asking Dr. Awad now. <laughs> yeah, being, I take the, the advantage being in South Asia, so I have the little bit background of that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, so moving on to the next question, there have been two on this issue, so I'll combine both of them. Um, so um, this question is for uh, Dr. Awad particularly. Uh, you spoke about Chinese inroads into the Middle East. So Swati is asking how increasing Chinese presence will influence the regional dynamics among states in the region and their relationship with the US. And adding on to that, I also wanted to ask you, there has been a lot uh, which has been written about how um, the Chinese inroads into the Middle East is apolitical and mostly economic in nature. But do you think China can really afford to be apolitical in a region like the Middle East and only focus on the economics under the Belt and Road Initiative? Thank you. I think this is a very important question. 
question. Yes, it is. It is the contemporary issues, which is everybody talking about the Chinese Silk Route, which is uh, trying to revive the maritime uh, Silk Route and also the uh, road by road. So therefore, there are 64 countries fall on this line and uh, out of which there is a $950 billion investment in this, including $1 trillion. And I think most of the Arab countries and the Muslim countries and West Asia falling on this line are suffering because the American definitely going to thwart the ambition of China and trying to contain China as a whole. China used its soft power for, for years, for since it has emerged as a, a superpower, you know, and they have used only politically and economically, they stayed away from the politics. They used the economic card very well. They stayed away from every politics in the region and every development. So they didn't even interfere with the American dominance in this part of the world. They stayed very closely watching this development. Till they have finished that soft power, now they are using the political and the military. They have changed their military doctrine, by the way. Why? Because there is a new angle to it. You know, I said that terrorism has been used in the region as a tool to achieve political objective. Now we have more than 5,000 Uyghur fighting in Syria, along with the terrorist organization ISIS and Al-Qaeda. If tomorrow there is peace in Syria, where those terrorists will go back? Will Turkey send them back to the Uyghur region and the uh, Xinjiang, Xinjiang? Well, where will people will be paying the price Xinjiang, but you call it the province, there where they, the East Turkestan? Will they have to go back and create more terrorist act in that part of the world? I think uh, the, the Chinese now using their military uh, hand to expand into this part of the world, where their investment go, they will increase their military presence as well. So therefore, we have to call it the Asian century. By the way, we cannot wash our hands from this. So the Chinese are here and they are here to stay. So they are challenging the West. Why? Because we in the Arab world and West Asia have seen the misery at the hand of the American and the West. And therefore, looking East policy or acting East policy is part of most of the Arab world and West Asian nation, by the way. And that is why you see there are lots of investment now in India, in China, in Japan, in Korea, because most of the investment in the uh, Western world did not give us anything. We didn't yield any result. The money in the United States, nobody can take it out. They say, we don't have money to give you $3 trillion. So you, you sleep on it. Europeans are unable to do much of it. They have colonized us. Asia did not colonize us. So China is there to play a role. And they are there for the prosperity of this region. And I think what we, the Americans are trying now to do to us is to put more pressure on the Arab world and the Muslim world to fall in line with the American for policy against China. And America cannot fight a war with Chinese because America are too coward to fight the Chinese. But they can do a proxy wars in the region. And these proxy wars will be Iran at one angle. It will be in, 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 in India or Afghanistan again, or it could be the south part of China. So Chinese trying to build this route in the economic and prosperity, but it is going to be difficult for them to achieve that goal with the United States opposing it by all means. So I think uh, the Chinese will have already made their military doctrine very clear. And I'm sure there will be a conflict of interest with the American and they will be having upper hand in most of the Arab country. Look at the Gulf country investment. The largest investment of China is in UAE, in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, in Iraq, and even in Egypt, the North African state, in Algeria, in Morocco. You're talking of billions of dollars. So I don't think anybody can throw those billions of dollars away in instabil instability, instable kind of country. So therefore, they have to play a major role to ensure their investment is safe, and their project is going to happen no matter what, even if there has to be in the future conflict with the United States. Because the United States is moving away from the region. It has its influence in, in the Middle East, in West Asia, and South Asia, GCC country, and Persian Gulf have moved, moved away. So there is a vacuum. And that's why we see China, we see Russia, Iran, Turkey are trying, Israel trying to fill that vacuum created by the American uh, dominance in that part of the world, because America is focusing more into the Asia Pacific. I must add the following. The United States does not help us and want us to 
countries choose help from China or any other country. And when China proposed to help Lebanon uh, during its economic and social crisis, current economic and social crisis, the States was not happy. They call on their, <clears throat> on their uh, uh, patron in, in Lebanon to, uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to, discuss, to uh, criticize uh, uh, President Michel Aoun and the policy of the Lebanese government to, to uh, achieve a good economic relationship with China, receive help uh, some beneficiaries from the Chinese government. China's foreign policy towards Syria and Lebanon and other countries in the Middle East is based on the on the uh, the international law, which call on people must decide their self, have the right for self determination, and not and, uh, and must for other countries not to appear uh, in uh, choosing the, uh, the system or the president of any country in, in the Middle East. This has been the Chinese foreign policy, foreign policy since 2011 at least toward the, uh, toward the Arab world or toward what's called Arab Spring. Uh, in addition, there are about 10,000 Lebanese businessmen and even more working in China to export commodity to the whole world. Why the United States does not allow Lebanon to have good relationship, good economic relationship with Iran, China, and any other country that, that represent a helping hand to, 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 to uh, help and hand toward us. I must, uh, finally, I must add the following. There is no such, such thing as American foreign policy in the Middle East. There is an Israeli policy, foreign policy, executed by the states. Absolutely. So, whatever work for good for the good of Israel, the United States support. And and historically speaking, Harry is to say the United States will not recognize or help any country unless this country recognizes the right of Israel to exist. Will rec will not recognize. The PLO as the sole represent PLO, which means the Palestinian Liberation Organization, will not support will not the PLO unless the PLO recognize Israel first. Uh, that that's what happened in Oslo Agreement of 1993, the disaster of Oslo Agreement of 1993. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Very important points to be noted over there. Um, now, going on to the next question by Ehman. Um, he wants to know whether the recent sanctions which have been imposed on Syria are affecting a Lebanon security and infrastructure, and if yes, then in what way? Um, I think he's referring to the uh, Caesar law. Uh, according to which American law, according to which the United States imposed sanctions sanction against Lebanon and Syria. Yes, it is affecting Lebanon dearly. Uh, we are suffering from the Caesar uh, law that, uh, uh, you know, the exchange between transactions between Lebanon and Syria, it has no, uh, and, 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 you know, nothing of the like in any, uh, between two countries in the whole world. Uh, there are so many Lebanese family and Syrian families are one families. We are almost one society between Lebanon and Syria. Yes, Lebanon is an independent state and Syria is an independent state with its recognized border. But the transactions between the, 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 both, our both countries is great. Now, because of the coronavirus and because of the law, uh, the transaction between these two countries had stopped. And in addition, billion of dollars deposited by Syrian businessmen in Lebanese bank, now they evaporate, we don't know where they are. We are talking about, about $3 billion or $2 billion of Syrian businessmen deposited in Lebanese banks, and now they are evaporated, I don't know where they is. So the sanctions, Yes, 
in, in answering the question, yes, we are suffering in Lebanon from uh, this, uh, uh, from the American sanctions against Syria. I, I think I, I fully agree with the Dr. Kamil point of view, and I would like to add two points here. I mean, the economic sanction as a whole is a kind of a terrorist action by any states used against any independent country, any sovereign nation. I mean, this is a terrorism in its different form where you are causing the people to be hungry, to cause that sanction on medicine, on food item, in any business you deal with Syria or Lebanon, the people are suffering. So basically, you are not punishing the regime, you are punishing the country as a whole and the people of this region. So the American, I said when Colin Powell came to Syria in 2000, and, uh, after the invasion of Iraq, 2005, he came with the with clear messages that that is our region. We wanted to implement the deal of the century by uh, focusing ma mainly on the Israeli dominance in the region. Forget about your own ideology or your own national interest. Our interest is only Israel, so cut your relation with Iran, dismantle the resistance forces in Lebanon, and then we can talk business with you and you can remain in power. So we said no. So the axis of resistance to the American dominance in the region and hegemony by the Israelis is being fought by tooth and nails of every citizen of, this, of the Mesopotamia because we understand that we are the target of the greater Israeli plan of the Euphrates to Nile, and we are part of their project. So therefore, we will not allow this. We suffered at the hand of the, look at the Syrian looting. Northeastern part of Syria is occupied by the American. They are looting the oil. They are selling it and giving to, the, to their forces they have created. Turkey is looting from the other hand, Turkish. Uh, uh, president with his son have looted all along with ISIS, the Syrian oil and the treasures and sold on the money and he made $10 million a weekly, his son Bilal. Nobody talked about it. So therefore, all our money has been exhausted from our coffers and we have empty handed because they want the people to come to the street and fight their own government. And that is what Dr. Camilo was saying when the people are trying to move. They were targeting the president of, of Lebanon, targeting the resistance forces because they are being paid to destabilize the country. And these are the two main uh, objects of the American dominance in this region has to be removed. So therefore, the sanction is affecting the people of the region. Yes, we are suffering, but we will never go to the dictation of the United States of America. There will be always a resistance to occupation. And as Dr. Kamil said, unless and until these, the, the Palestinian issue is not, not settled and Syrian territory did not return, Golan occupied Golan and the Sheba farm of, of, of Lebanon, there will be no peace in the region and there will be no effort no, nothing will affect us, even all the sanctions by the American and the uh, European on our side, on us. And excellent remarks uh, by uh, keynotes. I, I forget his name. I, I didn't catch his name. The first speaker, the one who introduced us. Dr. Julia. Dr. Professor Julia. Professor Julia. Professor Julia. Julia. Um, I must add here the following. The old Zionist project of a great Israel has failed. Israel cannot occupy more Arab lands. Now Israel project, new Zionist project, is to create a super Israel. That Shimon Peres talked about it in his book in 1996, The New Middle East, in which Israel would be the technological hub in which all the oil and gas came from Caspi into Syria and Lebanon to, to, to to, toward the, the Gulf states. And what, what this means, that Israel will cr create, will have investments in Arab countries, such as United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and so on, and will send its army to protect these investments. It's the same mechanism used by settlements before 1948, that build settlements and its army to defend these settlements. Now, Israel, for Israel, the, the, the new project is to have investment in the Middle East, in, in Arab countries, and send its army to this investment, which means that Israel wants to occupy the Arab decision in the Arab capitals. And that will never happen.
Thank you so much, sir. And I feel some very important points were raised over here, especially regarding economic sanctions. A lot of us feel the true uh, victims of economic sanctions are uh, the citizens of a particular country. We saw that in different scenarios, even in the case of Iran and Iraq previously. So it's the people who suffer, and I feel uh, they do not uh, deserve to be punished for something. It is a sort of terror in itself, terrorist, a form of terrorism in itself. Um, so thank you for those informative comments. now uh, we'll go to our last question which is uh, very very uh, deeply related uh, to what the center of middle east uh, tries to achieve that is peace through uh, promoting peace through dialogue so our last question is about the peace deal um, the so called peace deal between uh, bahrain and israel uh, so the question is that can this be seen as a precursor to a saudi israel deal in the future will saudi arabia also step into uh, signing a sort of peace deal with israel in the future and if yes then what would that mean for the region because there has been a talk that turkey also feels a sort of sidelined because of this new regional order that is being formulated between bahrain uae israel and the others uh, uh, thank you very much for this question as no such thing as arab israeli conflict there is a conflict between israel and some arab countries who are fighting israel so the issue of palestine for the united arab emirates saudi arabia bahrain uh, and uh, morocco then means nothing it means only to the levant to iraq syria lebanon jordan and kuwait these are the countries that have the real conflict with israel on all levels level of civilization a uh, conflict between uh, between uh, uh, between uh, the two cultures uh, doesn't have to be only military conflict it's it's a conflict at at all aspects so uh, united arab emirates and uh, bahrain recognize the right of israel to exist doesn't that we are moving one step forward toward establishing a peace in the middle east it doesn't mean that it may never it will not happen until israel withdraw from arab states and recognize the right of palestinian people to build their state on palestine on palestinian land with jerusalem as its capitals otherwise this conflict will go on and on for many years to come i respect your ambition to try to achieve some kind of dialogue toward the peace in the middle east but peace alone doesn't mean it doesn't mean only the negation of war peace also means building a democratic state with the human rights and actually rights of women women rights must be established in, in the middle east do they have the gulf states uh uh human human for uh, women and, uh, and uh, minority groups So you cannot have peace unless you build a state a strong state with the democracy with respect peace with Israel Israel must withdraw and uh, according to security council resolution at the end I may not have the opportunity to close uh, these remarks but I would say at the end after 2 years now I have a friend Rawen many friends at your centers and after two years spending here talking in the least a very complicated problem with all these protracted issues in the middle east involved i would say i i uh, deserve a, an indian citizenship i will be proud to become an indian belong to the indian civilization india culture of peace and human rights thank you so much thank you i think i think very interesting remarks have been made uh, by dr kamil and i believe that there is uh, uh, we are not the war mongers by the way in the middle east we never wanted a war in, in the region we are only fighting our rights which is also included in the un charter you have the right for your own to resist any kind of occupation of aggressions that is the right of each state and i believe that is taught in the international law as well so therefore what we are asking is implementation of the un security council in this regard that you have a coexisting two state solution 
One is a Palestinian state and one in Israeli. 1947 resolution of the UN Security Council 171 have given the Israeli land uh, as a state. They have accepted only as a state of Israel. But where is the state of Palestine? So we need a state of Palestine. We need our lands occupied Golan. It's not a part of Israel, if, even if gifted by, by Trump. Or neither Sheba Farm, it is, has to be part of Lebanon. So the question is here, is our party, the Israelis, are ready to go for peace with us? What, what price they want the peace? They want us to surrender or they want to give us seriously peace and an equal footing and equal sharing of the coexistence? Because after all, we are from the same father, but they are the Jew and we are the Muslim. So we are Samite, we belong to the same land, but we need to coexist together and you have to live with us otherwise the fight will be existence existence fight either we or them so therefore if they don't recognize the importance of giving the palestinian their right there can be no solution such country like bahrain or emirates or any saudi arabia may come online maybe tomorrow sudan or the these are all forced by the american to do and as the dr kemil said we failed to build up a state. So these are not even state to recognize. I'm sorry to say that, but they are not because what happened is all these leaders are not even taking the, uh, you know, the, the referendum of their people for their any peace deal with Israel. Take it from Egypt, Camp David. What did we achieve? Sadat went and the demonstration were in the state of Egypt. Jordan, Jordan from $4 billion in debt, now they are $42 billion in debt. What did they achieve with peace after 22 years with Israel? Nothing. Palestinian, Arafat signed the, the Oslo agreement and he said there was a, something written that there will be a Palestinian state. And then there was no Palestinian state. Why only the Arab failing to have a, Palestinian, uh, a, a peace with Israel when Israel refusing any kind of Palestinian or recognizing the Palestinian right of existence? And by the way, as a peace center, as a Middle East center here in India, I wanted you to ask even the people in the future, ask them what is the, really the map of Israel? What is the border of Israel? Do they accept this border currently or they have more ambition? Why it is so vague to have a state, but you don't tell us your border as well. So therefore the ambition of aggression and expansion at neighbor, it shows a sinister plan that you do not want this part of the world to be stable. And I don't think Israel hegemony in this part will remain for long because it has to be part of the Middle East and West Asia if they wanted to live with us. Otherwise, they will remain as a military enclave created by the colonized power and they will, not, will have a problem. Because the Jew, as we know, they only survived and they were saved by the Muslim during the Muslim era. And that's why we survived together. We recognize them, but they don't recognize the Palestinian or the Arabs in this part. They want land without people. It is not possible. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I totally agree. I mean, a peace needs to include the element of a just peace as well. <clears throat> it cannot be, it's not peace if one side uh, goes on to uh, you know, in, instate its uh, demands without by ignoring the other. Yeah. So agreed a just peace is a necessary aspect which has been missing in this current uh, negotiation between Israel, Bahrain and the UAE. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, informative session, sir. We would now like to conclude and um, it has been a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this discussion. Now, I would like to request uh, Dr. Amora, who is uh, going to be giving the concluding remarks. Dr. Amora is uh, the Vice Dean for Jindal School of International Affairs and also uh, the Director of the Center for Middle East Studies. I have had the privilege of working under Dr. Amora for almost two years now. And uh, I would like to briefly introduce him. His introduction can be very lengthy. So to put it uh, short, uh, Dr. Amora has been a career diplomat who has served in the uh, Syrian foreign ministry for more than 33 years. Dr. Amora has authored innumerable articles and four books on the Middle Eastern region. And uh, he has also spoken uh, about this about issues such as these, not only uh, within Jindal School of International Affairs, but outside in many different conferences. His interests include uh, the Middle East and uh, its global repercussions in different regions as well, and also diplomacy. Uh, Dr. Amora, would you like to uh, give the, uh, give your concluding remarks for this session? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much. After I have listened to what my two colleagues have spoken, Dr. Awad and Dr. Kamil Habib, I really feel, you know, quite hesitant 
to add anything. If I could, I cannot add to what they have said. But simply, uh, before that, I would say to my audience or to the audience that this center, Center for Middle East Studies, is a student-led and owned center, a center whereby there is a kind of balanced, you know, perspectives, etc., to not only one uh, perspective, as it is always, let's see and discuss and talk. It is the peace, it is a center promoting a peace. I would like to add in this that uh, had it not been for the support and encouragement of Professor Sholia, the Dean of the School of International Affairs and the higher uh, administration at OB Jandil Global University, we in the center or the students in the center could not, you know, do and achieve what they have achieved. Thanks to all and thanks also to the editorial board already now, uh, Tamana, Zeus and Farheen. But I would like to, as I said, to try to add some points. You know, we know a very simple diagnosis of the mean of politics. Very simple. I do not want, you know, my colleague, as I said, I have added detail. We notice the commonalities of all events that took place particularly, particularly in the uh, first two decades of the 21st century. And these are directed, these events were centered in specific countries, that is, do not go in line with the West and the Americans and not to, uh, actually didn't happen in the other. What does that show? It showcases that this is politics as we have known and learned is aimed to rationalize the irrational in a very logical through dialogue, through constructivism, through learning, through what we notice that unfortunately that the politics in the MENA is a quite the opposite. It is the irrationalizing of the rational. And that is concern of concerning all aspects, you know. What we notice also is that these commonalities have been uh, or can be summed up in the use of mercenaries, sectorianism, interface conflicts, you know, very and religious conflict and ethnicities, as if the world has not learned, you know, from past experience. Uh, if one goes to 19, uh, 16, 18, 16, 48, the 30 year war in Europe, it was exactly a copy, a copy of what has uh, happened. Mercenaries were used, uh, looting properties, blundering, uh, you know, huge destruction. What is that? This has have the world. This is this the world civilization. Now, as concerning, as a matter of fact, uh, this process of normalization of relations, uh, I would. Uh, a quote, uh, a saying that says, deceive me once, shame on you, but deceive me twice, shame on me. Now, for the Arabs, I would say, the Arabs have been deceived not only twice, but three times, four times, many times since the sykes Pico and since also the uh, the British pledge to the Arabs, you know, to fight and to establish and to support their uh, countries. That is 
this time of this scene, as Dr. Awad has referred, will that achieve a peace? I mean, the process of peace, what type of peace? Is it just a peace? Will it give, you know, the people the stability? Uh, has what or have what the events, either in Iraq or in Libya or in Yemen or in Syria or uh, now what's happening in uh, Lebanon? Has this uh, policy of irrationalizing the rational, has it led to stability? Now, it is an example that 30 year war in Europe have destroyed Europe. But we are almost now in 20 years, if we want to go to the Anglo-American war against Iraq, it is coming and going from bad to worse uh, and uh, all that. I believe that type will, that type of normalization uh, will mean nothing at all, as long as, you know, it is right. Right, might is not right. It is the right that is might, and the right that is based on international law, uh, on uh, democratic, real democracy. Uh, that will, it will further, unfortunately, lead to a further conflict and exacerbation of uh, the conflict and lead to instability, further poverty, as going for Erdogan and so on, you know, I believe if one, I have read, you know, Dr. Kamil Habib book, World Politics and the series of uh, world, world series of world politics and foreign policy and implication on the Middle East. As a matter of fact, there is a chapter about the politics of the fully. Now, mm -hmm. all the dimensions and so on that have been said and the characterization of the politics of the fully really are on this Erdogan's politics of the fully that will lead to a catastrophic end in the end of the day. Already, he is suffering internally. Internally, you know, economy is going down, stagnation, spending a lot of money, uh, using the mercenaries, and politically as well, uh, opposition has gone up. Now, I believe by this, and I would end, what the Arab world need really is a more than ever before, more than ever before, a new Arab Renaissance, a new Arab Enlightenment, especially investment in democratic process of leading the new generation, that the new generation will preserve the right in a right way. I would like to thank uh, all the participants, all the audience, in particular uh, Dr. Habib and Wael Awad. I would like also to thank uh, Tamina Zios and also the Dean for giving us his time and participating uh, in this uh, event. Hopefully it will not be, it is the end, it is the first, but it will not be the end. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amora. Thank you, Dr. Awad and Dr. Habib. It was a pleasure to host you. And thank you for all your informative comments. And I would also like to thank uh, the IT team for helping us organize this. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, uh, a big thank you to the Dean as well for uh, allowing us to organize this event. And congratulations to the center and all these youngest researchers are doing very well. I'm very happy to see the magazine and to see your work. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank, thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor thank Amura. You. Thank you, thank Dr. Kamil. Nice meeting you online, Kamil, virtually. Take, take care, Kamil. <laughs> Ma Dr. Amura, I wanted to, to give my books to Dr. Awad. 
Thank you. Important that he see my writings. Thank you, inshallah. I will be happy to see, read it. Thank you. Um, Thank you to all the participants for your questions and your participations. And now I would like to uh, formally conclude this session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.